Okay. We are now live. Good. So for the audience that doesn't know you, feel free to introduce yourself. Well, my name is Jim Lawler. I was a CIA case officer for 25 years from 1980 until 2005. And since then, I have taught a lot of intelligence courses, tradecraft courses to CIA officers, DIA officers, FBI special agents. And I do corporate insider threat seminars, uh, advising companies how to be alert to people inside their companies who may betray their intellectual property or their uh, corporate secrets. Since that was my job was stealing secrets, I feel like I'm qualified to tell people, you know, what motivates folks to commit espionage. And I've been doing that uh, ever since I retired. And I'm also now a spy novelist. I've written two uh, well-received spy novels. The first one was called Living Lies and the second one in the twinkling of an eye. And I'm almost finished with my third one. Right. Yeah. And um, with regards to, I mean, the main part of your career, it seemed like was flipping, like, you know, and yeah. getting targets to become spies for the CIA or agents. That's that, yeah, that's right. That's And you're using the right term. I'm not a CIA agent. I'm a CIA officer. I would recruit right. people who became my agents, my spies. Right. And that's a conversation I've had many times with different people. Um, Cause I used to say agent, like as an FBI agent, then it's got it was officer. Um, well, it's confusing because it's a central in intelligence agency, but yet we're not CIA agents. That was, a, that's a common mistake people make. Uh, we just call ourselves officers, either case officers or whatever our job specialty is. Well, officer too usually implies like officer of the law. Like, you know, when people think of an officer, they think of like a cop, not intelligence. Yeah, but we have the CIA, unlike the FBI, has no law enforcement uh, powers. In fact, if I were to go in with an FBI uh, group of agents on, say, a raid or something like that, I would have to be temporarily authorized to do that. I have no, I don't, I mean, typically uh, in most of my assignments, I would not carry a gun. I would not carry a badge. I might carry identification in the United States, but um, we're not law enforcement. Right, which is a basic um, like lesson for most people in the public. So let's get down more into what you did in your career and what you kind of learned from that. So, you know, when people talk about spies and being a spy and for the CIA and getting like inside men and such, right? It's less of a process of, you know, how it is in the movies where you're getting a guy all dressed up and like ready to infiltrate more as it is to get something that's already in and convincing them of how. So from start to finish, for the viewers that haven't seen you before, what is the the method, like the major method and way to get somebody to go from a loyal servant of their government or a loyal agent of their government or whatever role they may have into a spy or a source or an asset for the US government or the CIA? That's a great question. So I'll, I'll give you an example in just a moment, but it's a process that we call spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting, and then finally handling. So spotting, you have, an, say, a certain intelligence question, and I'm going to give you an example of that in, in just a moment. On my first tour, when I was uh, overseas in Europe, I received a message from CIA headquarters, and they informed me that the United States was going to engage in some high stake national security negotiations with a certain country a year later. And currently we had no sources that could reveal to us what their negotiating positions were. And so we wanted to have an inside peek at their cards. You know, when they come into the room, we want to know what their demands are, what their fallback demands are, all of their negotiating positions so we can be prepared to negotiate the best treaty, the best uh, arrangement for the United States. So I got this message and it said, look, be on the lookout for people from this particular country who are posted to the same country you are and who meet the following criteria. And it listed the type of experience that such a person and affiliation that person would have. And as luck would have it, George, I was in a uh, country that has mountains and snow and I'm a, I was learning how to ski. 
And so I was in a ski class with a gentleman from this foreign embassy that they were interested in, and he met exactly the qualifications that my headquarters wanted. Basically, he had the access. He was affiliated with the right organization. So at that point, I've spotted the guy. I know he's got access. I increase then what we call development, which means you're increasing the uh, friendship, the uh, degree of trust, because in order to recruit somebody, you need to have a foundation of trust. They're entrusting their careers and frequently their lives in your hands. And so they have to be able to trust you. And then also I was trying to assess him for what are his needs? What, are, what kind of stress is he under? What, what could I offer him that would convince him to become a spy. And, you know, I like to say I never once in my entire career did I ever recruit a happy person. You don't recruit happy people. You recruit unhappy people who need something. And that can be for a variety of reasons. So I started going out with this guy, lunches, dinners, uh, had his family over to see my family a couple of times. And finally, after two or three months of this developmental phase, I thought, okay, now I'm going to let uh, Langley, let CIA headquarters know how I'm going to recruit him. I want them to approve a, a financial package for him since he's not going to be doing this for free. So I proposed a certain financial package to CIA headquarters and I laid out why I thought I could recruit this gentleman. Now, remember, I'm on my first tour. I've never done this before. I've never, I'm under State Department cover, meaning I pretend that I actually work for the State Department in this embassy in this country, but in fact, I'm an undercover CIA officer. And so I have to have some kind of plan as to how I'm going to pitch this guy and why I think he would cooperate with me to become a spy for the United States. So I wrote this uh, message. We call it a cable. I wrote this top secret message back to CIA headquarters and I laid out the reasons why I thought I could convince him to become a spy. In hindsight, it was very naive. I thought just because we were good friends and because he had the access that I could convince him to become a traitor to his country. And that's very naive. It's really, I mean, it just shows you how naive I was going into this. But CIA headquarters was also naive or they were desperate, probably desperate, and they approved my rather ridiculous proposal to pitch this guy. So I took him to dinner and I launched into my pitch and I told him that if he could share inside privileged looks at their negotiating positions, that I was prepared to pay him a certain sum of money every month as a retainer, as a consulting fee. And this guy looked at me and he said, Jim, look, you and I are friends, but what you're proposing that's morally wrong. And I tr started to say something about how, well, one friend helping another friend is not morally wrong. But I thought, no, I better back off because he's, you know, he's, I don't want to offend the guy because we have a saying at CIA that it's okay to get turned down, but not turned in. Meaning, what if he complains to his ambassador that he was just propositioned by Jim Lawler of the American Embassy to become a spy, to become a traitor? And his ambassador had a reputation for being a real firecracker, a real hothead. And I could, in my mind, envision the ambassador storming into our ambassador's office and lodging a very strong complaint about the outrageous actions of young Mr. James Lawler, who just propositioned his employee. And I didn't mention what his position was. The guy I just pitched was the number two guy in his embassy. So basically, he was the ambassador's deputy. Whenever the ambassador would travel, this guy would be the acting ambassador, very senior officer. And we have this saying that, like I said, that, you know, it's okay to be turned down, but not turned in. And so I had this fear that what if he turns me in? And even though I've got this approval to do this, I can just see the people back home at CIA headquarters scrambling for cover, wondering how Lawler screwed this up. I'd be left hanging. So a big embarrassment on my first tour. So after about three days, I gave a, I got my courage up and I called the guy just to see if he and I were still on speaking terms. And I was relieved that he didn't hang up in my ear. And I said, I was just 
calling up to see, you know, if you'd like to go out again this next Friday. Last Friday was really a lot of fun. It was, it was good. I enjoyed it. And to my great relief, he said, Jim, you know, I was thinking the same thing. That's, that's good. Let's do that. So I go to this second big meeting with this guy. My only goal is to smooth any rough water there and somehow explain, if I can, that maybe my words were taken out of context. Maybe I was misunderstood. I'm sorry. I apologize if I insulted him, things like that. I wanted to smooth our relationship out, make sure we're still friends. Got to the restaurant, sat down, waiter gave us the menus, walked away. First thing out of this guy's mouth, Jim, that offer you made me last week, is that still good? I said, yeah, yeah, we're friends. That's why I made it. And he said, well, he said, what you don't know is that three days after, or two days rather, after our dinner, my wife announced that she wants a divorce. And I can't afford to go back to my home country next summer and pay her the alimony to which she's entitled and put my two high school age boys in, in private schools. Because in my country, you either go to a private school or you don't get a good education. I can't do that unless I take your, your offer, that consulting fee. And uh, I said, well, you know, that's great. And, I, and then he said, but you know, I know it's morally wrong. And I started to argue and I thought, you know, there's a thing that we learn in law school that if the judge rules in your favor, shut up and get out of court. So I accepted his, his offer. And then I started to learn that there's more than just that one motivation or, you know, he, he was over a financial barrel with the alimony. He needed the money for his kids, his two boys whom he loved. Those are powerful motivations. But I found out there was another underlying motivation that was probably even more powerful. And that's when he handed me a stack of classified papers at our next meeting. And he said, Jim, let me tell you something. What you don't know is I hate my ambassador. He steals credit for everything I do and everything everybody else in this embassy does. And he goes around this country acting like he's God's gift to this country. And he says, I just hate the guy. And as I hand you this classified material, it's as if I'm kicking that son of a bitch in the face. And I said, OK, you and I are on the same team. Bring me some more and let's kick the son of a bitch again. <laughs> So it was it was a, a revenge thing. He felt he was justifying this, that he was not betraying his country. His country had betrayed him first. His ambassador had betrayed him, belittled him, stole credit for everything he did. And so he justified his actions by saying how much he hated the ambassador. And and, you know, I found out that Revenge is one of those purest motivations for espionage. It's how they psychologically can justify it in their own minds why they do it. And uh, and he was uh, he was great. He went on, worked for us, and it turned out that when he went back to his home country, uh, it was estimated that he saved the U.S. government some, several tens of billions of dollars because he told us not only their negotiating positions but all of their fallback positions. And I always like to ask my students, I say, wouldn't you like to know if you're buying a house or a car, what the bottom dollar is that the seller will take before he walks away from the deal? And that's exactly what he told us. I mean, that's that's the kind of priceless information that we need to have in these negotiations. So that was my first significant recruitment. And it involves spotting, assessing, targeting, developing, and then finally recruiting. He was going back to his country and he was going to be handled by one of my colleagues who is a deep cover officer. We call it a non-official cover officer or a NOC, N-O-C. Uh, I know you had Jack Barsky on your program. Jack was basically a Russian, a KGB illegal or a NOC, non-official cover officer, deep cover. And so deep cover officers have no diplomatic protection. I have a diplomatic passport. If I get caught, the worst that can typically happen to me is I'm expelled from the country in the next day or two. I'm declared persona non grata. But if you're a NOC, a non-official cover officer, without diplomatic immunity, you can be put in jail. You can be shot. Anything can happen to you. So in order to guarantee that my friend whom I just recruited, or at least assure ourselves that my friend 
was in fact legitimate, that he was not a double agent, that he was not being directed at us by his home country, headquarters decided they wanted to put him through a polygraph test. Now, a polygraph test is sometimes mistakenly named a lie detector test. It's not a lie detector test. It's a stress detector. And so this was going to be a strict counterintelligence polygraph test to see if this guy is legitimately working for us and not being doubled at us by his home intelligence or security agency. And typically the case officer, myself, we would go over some very strict questions to ask the guy that involve counterintelligence. An obvious one would be, have you told anyone about your secret relationship with CIA? That should be an easy yes or no. Second one, are you working for any secret intelligence organization other than CIA? Very easy. And the third one should be, did anyone direct you to volunteer to Mr. Lawler at that last dinner meeting? Also should be very easy to guess or no. And the, the polygraph operator is supposed to stick strictly to those questions and not ask some off the wall question, unless the uh, guy that he's testing or gal that he's testing says something that causes the operator to ask. But in my case, I had a first tour, very young, very immature young polygraph operator. And the first words out of his mouth to my friend were, golly gee, I'm just curious why you're doing this. And I thought, oh no, don't, don't open that can of worms because my guy, my friend is going to have a moral epiphany and he's going to storm out of here. But no, he didn't. He started laughing and he told the polygraph operator and me, he said, you know, I think this is going to be a lot of fun being a spy. So he had a motivation of wanting to be like uh, James Bond. And that was another motivation. Anyways, that was my first significant recruitment. And that involved the entire, uh, as I say, the spotting, assessing, developing and, and recruiting. And then he'd be handled. I was handling him at first. But when he went to his home country, he was going to be handled by a deep cover knock officer. So this is now. So. Again, I told you that we have had many mutual people that we know. And one of the people that I talk to decently often is Bobby, right? And so I remember, you know, we, we just were talking about this where I asked him about with regards to federal law enforcement, right? And the CIA's actions. And, you know, obviously not everything the CIA does is legal in the sense of, you know, it's not legal in the traditional sense. Right. So a normal person cannot usually do what the CIA does. Right. Right. So in we have special we have special authorities that right. make it legal. But you're right. It's illegal. If I what I'm doing in other countries is illegal. That's illegal. But it's legal by U.S. law. <laughs> right. So my question is, has there ever been circumstances you can remember where federal law enforcement interfered um on accident or unintentionally, or in some cases, knowingly with, you know, what you're talking about, where like, like of other countries too, domestically or of other countries. Well, no, not exactly. We, I had, I ran a very sensitive counter proliferation operation for almost 10 years against the AQ con network. And we had to set up a lot of, of small businesses overseas. And then literally we had to launder money from the United States to these offshore places because we didn't want any American connection to, say, a, a, a company out in the Middle East or a company in Latin America. And so we would launder the money through offshore banks. Now, technically, that would be illegal, except we had certain senior people at the U.S. Treasury who were cleared into this operation and had anything gone wrong, had we been you know, examined or something, we would have gone to the person that we briefed on this and they would have gotten us out of trouble. We used to call that our get out of jail free card. So, yeah, I mean, there there's some things that we would do that, again, I mean, we did a number of entry operations overseas. An entry operation is basically a breaking and entering. You, you know that there's a target facility, you need to get in, you need to steal the intelligence and get out as quickly as you can and not leave any evidence that you were ever there. Those are highly illegal in, in every jurisdiction that I can imagine. 
So we would, you know, but we always did it very carefully with a special team called the physical access group. And the case officer would go in, I would go in with these people when they were doing the, uh, the entry operation and we would copy or steal whatever we needed to and then bring it back out. So that's highly illegal. It's a breaking and entering in all these other countries. Uh, but we were permitted to do that as uh, representatives of the Central Intelligence Agency. When it comes to um, how people work, so there was something that you said that was really interesting. I was going to ask about it before, but I forgot. So you mentioned about how you never recruited a, a happy person, like somebody that was satisfied with their life. So um, I'm sure you're familiar with who Charles Manson is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so with him, one of the quotes that he had when talking about how he recruited girls mainly, um, mm -hmm. but people in general into his cult, one of the things that he said was that he never wanted them to be broken, but he wanted them to be bruised. Right. That's, that, that's a good, that's an accurate, I mean, as, as much as uh, Charles Manson was a demon, uh, it's the same methodology. You're right. Uh, you're looking for somebody who's injured in some way, emotionally, financially, psychologically. We used to have an observation post where we might be looking at a Russian embassy. And if at five o'clock when it's quitting time, if we see three or four Russians come out and they're slapping each other in the back and they're heading off to a bar, we're not interested in them. We're interested in the guy that comes out five or 10 minutes later and he's by himself and he doesn't feel like he's part of the team and he's lonely and he's got some kind of hurt going on. And that's the guy that we're going to move up next to and, um, and, and recruit. And you're right. Uh, Manson was right. You want him injured, but not down and out because if they're so dysfunctional, they, they won't be good as an asset. Um, you know, in fact, they can they can bring trouble on themselves and trouble on you if they've got serious drug problems or serious alcohol problems or uh, maybe psychoses, things like that. So you, you've got to have somebody who's functional, but who is hurt, hurting somehow. And there's some way we can address that hurt and help them. Well, you know, you also want to fear people that have nothing to lose. So, you know, in their own minds. Like you don't want to recruit a guy that has absolutely nothing to lose at all. And well, he's like, right. well, right. I mean, you don't, I didn't like, for instance, in my first example, I didn't try to recruit the ambassador because he's on top of the world. He doesn't need me. I want to recruit his deputy. In fact, I recruited a number of people who are deputies because the boss always gets the credit. They're doing all the work. You know, they're not paid as well. They don't get their name in the lights, things like that. And so all of that is working in my favor. Yeah, exactly. Right. So when it comes to finding people that are dissatisfied with themselves, right? And, you know, this is going back to the Manson example, but also one of Manson's favorite books, which is called How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? So a lot of the principles in that book can be considered as manipulation because they're basically using basic human principles to get people to like you or influence other people around you. Um, yeah. But, you know, some of the principles include things like, you know, you don't want to criticize people, right? Because people that are convicted of an opinion by force will be of the same opinion still. That's one, um, you know, you want to smile a lot. You want to ask a lot of questions to come from a place of understanding and validation. You want to validate how that person feels, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the basis of it is to be genuinely interested in that person and to come across as having the person's best interests at heart and convince them that for whatever reason it is in their best interest to um to join you or to team up with you right. so how how do those principles apply in that like on a person to person conversation for a recruitment that's a great that's a great question george in fact i have i do a talk on how i recruit people and I list uh, 10 qualities of how to be a very successful recruiter or to be persuasive. It's the same thing. And the number one quality is something you just touched on, and that's curiosity, just to be curious about somebody. Uh, but when we first came uh, on this program and I was talking to you before the recording began, I asked you where you lived. I asked you some other things, how to pronounce your name. And I'm sure that made you feel good that, you know, I pronounced your name in the correct French way, no Pereton, 
And, uh, and so that makes you feel good because you feel like, well, Jim's interested in me. And in fact, that helped me in my uh, ability to keep my cover because hardly anybody ever really tried to penetrate my cover. And that's because they're not interested in me. They're interested in them in themselves. And so I was always play to that, that I wanted, and I'm a naturally curious person. So I would say, tell me all about your life. Tell me about, you know, where do you want to be in five years? What's your, you know, if you could do something differently in your life and people just are hunger, hungry to tell somebody that they like all about themselves. Now, the second quality, which goes hand in hand with the first one is a keen listening ability. You don't recruit people when you're talking. You recruit people when you're listening and letting them fill the silence and telling you all about themselves. The third quality is what I call extreme empathy. If I want to recruit you, George, I want to get inside your head and find out what makes you tick, what your stresses are, what you like, things like that. Again, it's flattering because I'm learning about you and you think, well, Jim really cares about me. The fourth thing is uh, patience that you have to be patient. Some people uh, are not recruitable now, but they might re be recruitable, like in my example, a week later. That guy was not recruitable, but then a week later, he was. So life, things happen in people's lives. One time it took me 11 years to recruit one of my assets, one of my targets. And that's because the first 10 and a half years, he was a happy camper. He was on top of the world. He was happy and healthy, everything. Well, along about years five or six, he and I had been very close, very good friends. And he asked me to be best man at his wedding. And so I was. I mean, that's how much, that's how close I get to some of these people. I was best man at this guy's wedding. And then, um, unfortunately, after he moved abroad with his new wife, after about three years, she became very disenchanted, did not like living thousands of miles from her home country. And so she asked my friend for a divorce. They'd had a child. So again, psychological turmoil of a divorce, one of the most psychologically harmful things anybody can go through. He's going through that. She goes off, takes their newborn child back to her home country. And then he finally gets posted back to his home country and in the 10 years that he's been gone, almost, his ethnic group is no longer on top. In fact, there's a new ethnic group, a new racial group that's in power. And he's discovered that he could work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and he can never be promoted again because he's not of that ethnic group. And he wrote me an email and he bluntly said, Jim, how can I give allegiance to a country which treats its citizens like that? So at that point, I knew he was ripe for recruitment. And so I agreed to meet him abroad somewhere. And it took me 30 seconds to basically break cover, tell him I was really a CIA officer and ask him if he would join my team. And his words to me were, Jim, now I've got something to believe in. So it's, it's patience is very, very uh, necessary. The next quality is persistence. Sometimes I've lost a recruitment by not just going back and asking again and again and again. And so being persistent. Six, creativity. Absolutely need more creativity. Seven, I think I've already mentioned this, being a careful observer of stressors in people's lives. You don't recruit happy people. The eighth term is what I call ruthlessness, which sounds harsh, but basically that means never forgetting why you're doing this and what you're doing. Uh, that you're not doing this to just get a friend. You're doing this to recruit a spy. And I tell my students that if you've never had a recruitment pitch turned down, you haven't pitched enough people. You need to be constantly out there pitching to see what are the limits here? You know, I mean, how do I handle this? And in fact, I give a talk sometime where I list all of my failures. And I call it my favorite failures because you learn more from failure than you do from success. So basically, not forgetting what you're doing, remembering you're recruiting this person to become a spy. Uh, the ninth quality is having a powerful or persuasive personality. I don't know how persuasive I am, but they've told me that my voice is very seductive. I had at least two of my assets say that when they're listening to me, it's like their brain is in a warm water bed. 
That's what I and I want them to confide in me, and I can be their therapist. And then finally, the most uh, I guess mystical of all of these qualities is what I call the metaphysics. And this is where a certain small, small number of case officers have an ability that the way I envision this is they literally can link into somebody's mind metaphysically. And that person, it's, it's, it's kind of like hypnosis, but it's more. And it's basically getting that person hooked in. I almost, I envision like a mental hook going from my head to yours to where I'm hooked into you. And then you want to, you want to do what I want you to do. And that's, that's what I call the metaphysics. So those are the 10 qualities of a successful recruiter. Well, in terms of, um, I mean, we can be very broad here, right? And we can scale this up between lying to people, right? And you know, there's, there's a number of different things I'm thinking about as you're saying all this. But one of the major recruitment tactics that people use is effectively bribery, right? It's, you know, we know you're going through this and we're going to give you X, Y, and Z to help you through this. Right. It's something that Bustamante talks a lot about, something that you've talked about um, on some of your interviews. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, and I, as you were saying all this, I'm thinking about, and like the lonely guy, for example, that is more willing to betray. So are there ever circumstances where you implant an idea in his head? So I'll give you an example. Like if he's sitting there and, you know, Let's say you're friends with him and you're aware that he's kind of not part of the group. He's kind of an outsider of maybe, let's just say it's the FSB. Like, let's say he's a little bit of an outsider in that organization, mm -hmm. right? So imagining that and then you get, you know, you become friends with him knowing this, you know, would you ask the question of, you know, how's your work? Like, you know, how's the job? And then you start getting into it, posing as somebody curious, and then eventually you get to, how come you don't like it? Or, you know, like, you have any friends there? Like, eventually you get, like, will you ever implant an idea like that, where you're convincing them that the country isn't good or very broadly, or that the organization isn't good, or they don't really care about you or like things that are technically true? Absolutely. In fact, I call that, um, what you're doing is a tactic that I call that uh, small crack in the windshield. Have you ever been driving down the street and a stone is is from the car in front of you hits the windshield and it's just a slight crack there and then that crack over the next few weeks starts to spider web out so i'm planting a seed of something there it's not actually i'm not pitching them but i'm planting a seed that i care about them and i may i may say something about uh, i may make up something about maybe my own difficulties with my boss to see if they reciprocate and talk about difficulties with their boss or, or I'll, uh, you know, joking about something, or sometimes I'll do a hypothetical and what I call a reverse pitch where I'll tell the target that I had two friends and one of them had some access to some really good information and the other guy, he needed it. And so they formed a partnership and they split the uh, profits from this. And I've had more than one of my targets say, well, Jim, you and I could do something like that. And I said, well, no, tell me how you tell me how we do that. And then the guy actually he's pitching me to to offer me these things. That's called a reverse pitch. So, yeah, planting a seed in somebody's mind sometimes. Well, the, the one that I just talked about a few moments ago that took me 11 years at the uh, at his uh, rehearsal dinner five years earlier, I had said, look, you know, uh, I want you to know that you and I are brothers. And if you ever really need me, I'm there for you. I have special channels back in Washington and I will do anything for you. You know that I didn't really pitch him, but I, I planted that seed that he had a friend, a brother that would help him out if he needed it. And then four or five years later, guess what? That, you know, that was that was it. Another time I pitched a um, an African intelligence officer and he turned me down. He said, Jim, they hang people in my country for doing things like that. I said, oh, yeah, well, actually, if he was right, they would. But uh, then he surprised me and he said, could I have a rain check on that offer? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my son's three years old. I don't need you now. But in 15 years, he'll be college age and I'll need you then. So I wrote that down. The guy got posted to Washington and they asked me if I thought he meant what he said. And I said, yep. And so sure enough, George, that rain check was cashed in 15 years later. But I had planted that seed. Say, yeah, okay, you know, 
tell me about it. You know, let us know. <laughs> we'll we'll go with it. So, in terms of um, what's it called? Not. I'm trying to think. What I was going to say. I had a good question. So, um, when we're talking about you know giving people ideas and planting those ideas, right? Mm -hmm. You never, um, so one thing I was thinking about that I've had conversations about with mainly Bobby was that when it comes to the favors that you do, um, or the favors that you want to get, I'm sorry, the favors that you want to get for, from these people, right? Whatever they might be, you never, or you rarely want to convince, and this is something I came up with, um, just in our conversations. It's the fact that you don't probably, you probably wouldn't want to convince whatever that that person has is a big deal because then they have power in that conversation, right? Because, you know, if we're defining power as control, right? A power dynamic is a control dynamic. And we're talking about, you know, I want a favor from you. Um, you, you do you know who um, Robert Greene is? No. Robert Greene is the author of The 48 Laws of Power. So okay. one of the rules, he's studied human nature for countless years and he's written all these books about it, but one of them is you don't want to play to people's mercy. Right. Oh, absolutely not. In fact, you want to stay in control uh, yeah. when you recruit somebody and when you're handling somebody. Sometimes that can be a challenge. In fact, if a case officer is rather weak and, and things, we sometimes say, who's running who? You know, because sometimes the agent, the person he's the source is actually running the case officer. So you always have to stay in control. You you dictate where the meetings are. You say, look, no, no, this is the way we're going to do it. I'm the intelligence professional. Uh, because uh, if you recruit a scientist, you know, they think just because they're so smart that they're smart in the in the craft of espionage. No, they're not. <laughs> in fact, they can be very foolish. So you have to keep reminding them, yes, you have a Ph.D. in physics or in chemistry, but I have like the equivalence of a Ph.D. in espionage. And you need to you need to do what I say so we can both stay safe. And so you have to be firmly in control. And and your the case officer has to be firmly in control of the operation. Who is the most naturally persuasive or seductive? Um, I'm talking seductive generally, right? Not sexually, but seductive right. or persuasive person that you've just naturally met. Like from the get go, they could they they could um, they could just convince anybody of anything. Very persuasive, almost hypnotic, like what you were saying. Well, we had a, we have one of our best recruiters ever is a good friend of mine named Joe Petinelli. And Joe had the ability to put a smile on your face. You were always happy when you were around Joe. And that's a quality, it's charisma. I don't know what it is. And he was a, he's a very thoughtful person in any event. And so he would do favors for people. Um, we had, when he was overseas, you know, we had access to the military PXs and we could get, say, stereo equipment or uh, computers at deep discounts. And so he would always have the PX catalog there and let his foreign friends look at it and said, you know, if you want to if you want to get a really high end stereo, I can get this at a super cheap rate and I can go to the PX and get it for you. And he's gotten more, you know, done a big favor for somebody by doing it. But he has he's a very, you know. Uh, congenial guy, very nice voice, um, just a, a super, super recruiter. Another was an African-American case officer named Bobby Harris. And Bobby was wonderful. He could recruit anybody. I mean, the guy, you know, could have taught classes and a master craft of recruiting. He's just a very affable, very, very nice guy that you wanted to be around. And you just couldn't help but smile when you saw him. What's something that you feel um, during these flipping, recruitment, whatever term you want to use here, um, when it comes to doing it, what's something that you feel is overlooked? Like a, for a lot of the people doing the job, you think that people just overlook it all the time and it would make your job a million times easier if people or would have made your job a million times easier or made even their jobs easier if they just weren't um if they just weren't overlooking this one thing well to constantly be attuned to this person's needs and and it's not all about money in fact money rarely is we have a an acronym called mice m-i-c-e money uh ideology coercion ego 
I can tell you right now, money never by itself plays a part. It's the other four, the other three ideology, meaning I hate communism or I hate fascism or I hate whatever, you know, my government, the way they treat people or I I'm so dead set against nuclear weapons. You know, that's an ideological belief and that can be very motivating. The third one, coercion, is something we don't use, but a lot of foreign services like the Russians and the Chinese, they will try and blackmail people. In fact, they will blackmail people and hold, a, you know, in essence, uh, threaten to expose them, uh, maybe get them involved with a, you know, a prostitute or, or something like that, a, a, what we call a sparrow, and uh, then threaten to blackmail them if they don't cooperate. Now, I'm not going to deny that we've done that in the past, but we found out that, you know, I just don't like doing that. And it's not a moral reason. It's because I don't want a rattlesnake in the backseat of my car as I'm going down the street where this person is only doing this because they feel threatened. I want somebody who wants to help me, who wants to steal that intelligence and give it to me and who wants to figure out new ways to steal intelligence. And then the final thing, ego, ego is probably the most powerful one of all. That plays into the revenge factor. That plays into they're jealous of something that their uh, maybe their colleagues have. Uh, that maybe somebody has insulted them, and so it's an ego problem. And the way they get they get re retribution is cooperate with us. But that's the acronym MICE M I C E money ideology coercion and finally ego. In your everyday life, right? you know, when it comes to talking to people, where have you seen like the greatest improvement from, you know, taking, like learning these skills over the years that you've done it and perfecting them effectively, you know, has it helped you at all? Like maybe in just your social skills, maybe in your everyday life, maybe if you're trying to be a little bit more persuasive, just in a very like, well, simple, I'll give you, yeah. yes, exactly, George, I'll give you an example. And by the way, I didn't intend, I don't intend to be to have got to have profited from this, but I accidentally profited from the following situation. I was at a, uh, at a major U.S. airport and I was standing in line and the man in front of me was screaming at the ticket agent because the ticket agent would not uh, give him a courtesy upgrade to business class. And this guy was just berating this poor woman and saying how he was a such and such traveler and he came, used their airline all the time. And this was just outrageous. I mean, literally the guy was screaming and hollering. So he goes away. And so I'm next in line. And I said to this poor woman, I said, you know, that's outrageous that you have to put up with this. I said, that's, that's just unacceptable. And, you know, I know you work hard and, and you don't deserve to have somebody treat you like that. And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Lawler, how would you like an upgrade? <laughs> and so, I mean, just by being a, a, a nice person, using the golden rule to treat others like you want to be treated, that, that works wonders. And so I think it's, it caused me to be a better listener. It's, uh, you know, to be more patient with people, to know that there's more than one side to a problem and that uh, people are motivated by very, very different things. And, to and and to not take an initial impression and let that be your only impression of somebody a lot of times they're a lot deeper than that frequently they are and you need to give that person a uh, more of a chance and again being curious and asking them to talk to you tell you about things um, that works wonders so you know i mean as i mentioned before the very general principle of you know what's it called sorry i just got a notification um i was going to say the very general principle of books such as like dale carnegie's book um you know which is how to win friends and influence people it's again as i said before i'm going to say it again it is to be genuinely interested in that person to be like a puppy dog as you would say um but there was also another saying it's called it it goes talk to a man about himself and he'll listen for hours Right. So there's, that's another one. Um, but so what do you, when you're talking to people, um, as like a, a recruitment officer in the stages of trying to get them to just know you and like you as a friend, right. And to get them to trust you, what are some of the questions that you're asking them? Like, what are the starter questions when you're trying to meet this person? That you're well, using? to find out what, find out maybe what their hobbies were. Uh, in the one case of the guy that took me 11 years to recruit, 
I just cold called him on the phone. I saw he had arrived in this foreign country that we were both in. He had arrived, I think, a week after I did. So I, I thought, okay. So I just cold called this guy and said, look, how would you? I just arrived, you know, a week before you. How about we go to lunch? So we went to lunch and it turned out we shared a hobby and that hobby is long distance running. And so uh, we started going out on runs every Saturday and we go five, six miles. And I'll tell you, he was 10 years younger than me and a hell of a lot more physically fit. I mean, the guy was a marathoner, a, you know, really world class guy. I'm not. But the way that helped was I let him do all the talking, you know, because I'm there breathing hard. And uh, it worked well because we're, we're both runners. Uh, another time we were interested in a certain target and we knew he had access to information we wanted, but the officers who had met him because of the um, delicacy of their cover, they could not come out and pitch the guy and recruit him. But what they were able to do was provide me with a lot of insights into his life. The fact that he loved j certain jazz, the fact that he loved certain movies. And then it turned out they knew that he was going to give a public address at a certain place. So I went there. It was open to the public. And uh, after he gave this talk, I went up and I congratulated him on what a fine talk it was. And knowing that he liked fine cuisine, I asked him to a, a starred restaurant that was somewhere close by for lunch in a few days. And then when we were at lunch, I brought up the fact that uh, as a relaxing time, I love to listen to certain jazz artists like Miles Davis, you know, the Brubeck uh, Quartet. I love to uh, watch movies. One of my favorite actors at the time was Woody Allen and he loved Woody Allen. And so it's like we're 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 kind of like long lost twins <laughs> that uh, we can identify with one another. You know, maybe the type of reading we like or, or a, a sport we show, a share, a hobby, something like that, where you, you kind of figure out how can I appeal to this person on, on a personal basis? So switching gears now from mm -hmm. persuasion, talk to me about your book, about the book that's coming out. Um, that you just got finished on, I believe? Well, I'm about to finish it. I, this has taken me longer than I want. It's called The Traitor's Tale, and it's about a uh, very skillful, very skilled uh, case officer who is suspected of espionage, of being a mole for the Russians, and yet he's innocent, and his, um, he's finally exonerated because they catch the real spy. But uh, at that point, he decides to volunteer to the Russians. And so it tells about why he does this, what's he doing, and uh, who are his friends that stick with him and who are the ones that abandon him and treat him like a leper. And so that's the traitor's tale. And that uh, hopefully will be out in the fall. My other two books, uh, the first one, the other two books involve either nuclear weapons or biological weapons. The Living Lies is about nuclear weapons. And In the Twinkling of an Eye is about biological weapons. And they've gotten, they've gotten really, I've been very happy with the fact that I'm getting about 92% either five stars or four stars on Amazon for those books. So that's, that's been good. Absolutely. And I'm happy for you for that. And who knows, maybe I'll buy one of your books. Maybe I'll buy all three. I got so many books that are recommended to me, so it's going to take a while, but I'll let you know when I read them. Um, okay, George. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I just want to now I'm having another question now about uh, persuasion and the topic of, you know, flipping mm -hmm. tactics. And so if you had to put it down in one sentence, if you can, right, of how you convince somebody to do something that would not would generally be against their values, what's the key? Well, I don't think you can probably get them to do things that are totally against their values. Although I can also say that of all the people I've recruited, I don't think any of them would have ever, when they first met me, thought, well, I'm going to become a trader for Jim. Uh, I think the, the quality that's most important for a, a recruiter is empathy, to get inside somebody's head, to understand what, what they're going through, what the stresses are, to be the good listener and to let them know that you feel for them, that there is help, 
that you can you can think of ways to help them out. And and so when people feel that you're genuinely concerned about them, they're going to be much more sympathetic to doing basically reciprocity to helping you out uh, and doing something. I uh, used a, a tactic a couple of times where I'd take one of my targets. That's what we call them before they're recruited. A target. We take them. I take them to lunch. We have a good conversation, and then uh, I'd write up something. And the next time we had lunch, I'd say, you know, that uh, conversation we had last week. I hope you don't mind, but I took the liberty of writing it up and sending it into Washington. And this morning, I was surprised when I got this message from Washington that said they loved the information so much. They're giving me an exceptional performance award of two thousand dollars, but I can't. I can't accept all that. I feel like we're a team, and I absolutely insist that you take half of it. And so I'd have an envelope with a thousand dollars, and I'd slip it across the table. Now the the conversation that we had probably wasn't classified, but it might have had some sensitive details in it. But the target's going to be thinking, "Gosh, if Jim will pay me a thousand dollars for something like that, I wonder what he'd pay me for something that's really sensitive." And so it leads from there. We, I, you get them on your side. You get them as part of the team. They're telling you some things that are somewhat sensitive. And then you just get them kind of slipping down that slope. You know, so the old saying is, in order to boil a frog, you don't put him in boiling water. You put him in lukewarm water and you just gradually turn up the heat. You get, you know, I want something a little more interesting. You know, come on, George, we can do this together. You can help me out <laughs> and I can help you. That's the foot in the door phenomenon. That's what it's right. called. Right. Where, where you just get a little bit of your foot in the door, you open the whole thing. Right. And, right. Talk to them and and say, you know, it's it's great working with you. It's always fun to see you. It's it's you, you, you lead such a fascinating life. Or I might say, you know, they're not treating you right. You're worth a heck of a lot more than that. Uh, I had, in fact, this guy, Bobby Harris. I know um, he they didn't want him to pitch this one particular target. So these people other case officers pitched the target and the target came out of the room and he says to Bobby he says, geez, I don't know about this. I just don't know. And Bobby says, well, what did they offer you? And he says, oh, they offered me $2,000 a month. And Bobby said, 2000, is that all you're worth at least 4,000? The guy, like, okay. <laughs> and he ended up working for us. So, I mean, you know, and Bobby was on supposedly on his side. He says, no, no, that's ridiculous. No wonder you turned it down. You're clearly worth twice that. So now what I'm thinking about is, uh, so so talk to me about the position of lying and all this. So I'm somebody that like when I'm looking or, so number one, I generally am of the position that lying is not a super useful tool. Because, I agree with you. I agree because you're going to get caught in a lie. And I rarely, if ever lied, I might stretch the truth or I might not say the whole thing, you know, but for instance, people could say, well, Jim, you were undercover posing as a State Department officer. That's a lie. Yes, but it's for self-protection. But that would be the extent of my lies. I'm not lying. We're not professional liars. We don't because you can get caught on that. Right. So, yeah, so I'm obviously of the same position. Not only is lying wrong and it generally is very hard to keep up with and it's a bad habit to get into. I can get into all the reasons why I hate lying. But um, when it comes to it being used as a tool, it's just not an effective tool. Right? I, agree. I agree. It's better to stick to the truth. Uh, you may not say everything that's in the truth, but but yeah, sticking to the truth as much as possible. Uh, so I, I totally, totally agree with you. Now, you may exaggerate sometime. You may say, George, that was brilliant. That was you know really good or a little bit flattery, you know. Uh, when in fact, maybe it was just barely acceptable. But so you might use some exaggeration at times, as long as it doesn't sound too phony. Um, you know, you have to you have to feel your way through this and and see what is it that turns this guy or gal on? You know, what is it about them that I can say something? If it's a woman, I might compliment her on her, her hair, might compliment her on her dress, uh, something like that. I mean, Women like to be, you know, I might say, you know, your eyes are gorgeous, you know, uh, something like that. Women love things when you say things like that. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm truth. I'm truthful. You know, I, I'm fascinated by eyes and things like that. So, um, 
but yeah, I don't, I don't think we were really into lying much. Right. So uh, now the next part of that is actually, that's kind of interesting. So are there major differences between genders? Like of between like what might incentivize one gender to do something than another other than, you know, like maybe, uh, it, Actually, you know what? I'm not even gonna say it because you probably already know what I'm thinking when I'm gonna say that. But um, like, what do you like? What are the major differences, and what might incentivize one gender as opposed to another? That's that's a great great question. I recruited a number of females, and one thing you got to be clear on is that they not mistake your attention for romantic attention, uh, unless they want to just you know fantasize about that. But um, you know, we're not we're not hopping into bed with foreign women. In fact, you can get in a lot of trouble for that. Uh, so, um, but I'd say the same. Uh, you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I mean, I think women have the same needs as men. Maybe sometimes the emotions are different. Uh, they're deeper. They, um, you know, they they want to feel protected. They want to feel like you are a, uh, a stand up guy that you'll protect them, that you'll take care of them. Um, and so, that, you know, there's, and, and if it gets uncomfortable, I've had some female targets that I felt like she was mistaking my attention for something else. And I would basically introduce her to a female colleague of mine, uh, somebody who could then take the relationship maybe further than I could or further than I was willing to take it. So, um, um, but I, you know, people are people and, I recruited maybe not as many women as I did men, but I, I recruited a number of women and they have uh, certain, you know, psychological and emotional and financial needs like anybody else. And if it has to do with their children, whoa, they'll do anything for their children. So, um, you know, like any mother would. Do you have any advice for young people? Who are considering going into the CIA? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically you're going to need at least an undergraduate degree and probably a graduate degree. And if you have a foreign language, that helps a lot. Um, so, um, in fact, I mentor a lot of, usually on an average week, I mentor two or three young people that are interested either in CIA or something in the intelligence community. And I always tell them, you know, if you're going to go after a language, try and make it a hard language like Russian or Chinese or Arabic or Farsi or Korean. Although other languages like Spanish or French or German are fine too. And, you know, do well in school because you can't get into the agency without a, uh, a good grade point average. And then you're probably going to have to go to graduate school and get a degree in um, either a law degree like I did or an MBA or maybe a graduate degree in national security studies. And, uh, and then don't be disappointed if we don't take you into the organization when you're only 22 or 23 years old. We tend to look at people that are mid to late twenties, early thirties, and so that we want people that have had a lot of uh, experience, that are more mature. Uh, if you've lived abroad, that certainly helps. If you've worked abroad, that that uh, certainly helps too. And I always tell people too: don't consider just the CIA. Think about the FBI. Think about DIA. Think about NSA, and other parts of the intelligence community. Uh, well, I mean, more generally, too, I was going to say with regards to helping, like, what advice you have for young people in general for their lives? Like, not even ones that want to go into intelligence. Well, being a good, I think the qualities I listed for being a good recruiter, being a li good listener, being curious. I had a, a friend of mine, I guess it was on my third tour, and he said, Jim, I know why you're successful. It's because you're so curious. And I'm just a naturally curious person. I, if I hadn't become a uh, case officer, I would have loved to have been a psychologist or a psychiatrist and uh, just see how what makes people tick. Uh, and you'll find out that that helps you become very popular is you know being a, a genuine person, curious person. One other thing I would stress is um, practicing public speaking to be able to give a talk, to give a speech, to give a briefing. This will serve you well in whatever profession you go into to be able to communicate. So being a strong communicator is certainly going to help, help you out in virtually any endeavor that you go into. 
All right. I think that's a good place to end off. I'm going to stop the recording. We'll talk a little bit after the show. All right. Okay. I'm going to stop recording now. In three. Do you have any final parting words before I end it? I just enjoyed the show very much, George, and you had some great questions. Thank you. No problem. Welcome back anytime. All right. In three, two, one.